Beth Zebarth, and I am the director of Access Smithsonian, and I'm very happy to be the moderator for a panel on accessibility today. So a little framework for what we are going to be talking about. About 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability. That equates to more than 1 billion people in the world. And in the United States, the statistics are that um, 25% of our population has some form of disability. Disability should be understood in terms of barriers in the environment, physical, communication, information, social, and policy, rather than believing there's something wrong with the individual that needs to be fixed. We need to fix the environment, not the individual. So, in some respects, um, today with, the, uh, with this particular panel, we are talking about accessibility, which is really kind of the meeting the minimum um, that is necessary to um, include people with disabilities. But what we want to move towards is inclusion and inclusive design. And inclusive design welcomes and engages people at the ends of the natural human spectrum of ability, age, and culture, and thus serves all people within the full range of the spectrum. And what we are trying to do is make sure we have integrated and equal opportunities for everybody who wants to participate in what the Smithsonian offers. So today we have four speakers, Amy Hurst, uh, Jacob Kim, Leanne Masidi, and Cesara Windrum who will talk about the work that they are doing, which is moving beyond accessibility and more into inclusion. So if Amy would come up, she can do her presentation. Thank you, Beth. Hello and good morning. Let's see, did that do the right thing? It did, hi, phew. All right, hi, uh, my name is Amy Hurst. I'm an associate professor of human computer interaction and also the director of the Ability Project at New York University. Um, since some of you might not know what human computer interaction is or what the Ability Project is, I'm gonna start off my talk by describing those just a tiny bit. And then I'm gonna give you some, what I hope is really, really practical advice in how, um, approaches that we've taken to address accessibility challenges um, at museums in collaboration with university students. So all of my background and training is in human-centered design and accessibility. I personally, as a researcher, identify as someone who evaluates current accessibility problems and study challenges and opportunities for technology to empower people. Now, I've got this word called people here, and it turns out I will always have a job because people are very, very complicated. Um, this came up a little bit in our keynote this morning, which was exciting to see. Um, and people are complicated in many, many ways. And as an accessibility researcher, I, it's important to understand um, individuals' ability but I think too often we focus exclusively on ability in an accessibility context. So just to give you guys a sense of how I approach things, yes, ability is very important if we wanna empower people and solve accessibility challenges. However, we also need to understand these individuals' habits and their preferences and probably many other factors that are relevant. So how do we do this? Well, in my work, my approach is to involve people early and often. So we have two kind of like at a big level categories that we do this. The first is a technique called participatory design where we early on try and um, come up with different kinds of solutions. And what we do is we actually invite our target population onto our design team. This is where the participatory design um, word kind of, the plays out. So we invite them onto our user, or into our team. They're actually helping come up with prototypes. They're coming up with solutions. Um, I love this picture in the middle. So we have some like 
uh, sticky notes and brainstorming, and then we have this picture of this woman holding a clipboard, which was a prototype of um, some kind of navigation aid that could be worn around the neck. And so if you can see, it, it's a clipboard with some string around it. And it's not beautiful, but it helps us learn a lot of things. And so as a design member, this woman happened to be blind, was able to talk through a lot of ideas about where we could or could not put iPads in a, a museum context. And then finally, field work or any kind of work where we're in the real world. We're able to build significant relationships with end users in the environments where the interaction is actually happening. So what is the um, NYU Ability Project? It's an interdisciplinary research space that is dedicated to the intersection between disability and technology. Uh, and the key word here is interdisciplinary. So at the Ability Project, we are always, always thinking about interdisciplinarity and how we can bring people with lots of different expertises together to solve these accessibility challenges. Um, and there are usually three groups that we draw from most frequently. The first is um, our engineers who are at our Tandon School. Um, and they focus on integrated digital media. Then we have students and faculty from ART, which is TISH and has the um, ITP or Interactive Telecommunication Telecommunications Program. And then in the School of Steinhardt, we have occupational therapists. So what do we do with all these groups of people? And why am I here at the Smithsonian Digitization Conference talking to you about it? Well, this is the kind of the big takeaway here is we have two different approaches to looking at accessibility and museums. Um, the first one is that we actually teach semester-long classes to explore accessibility challenges. And then the second is we work with museums to help identify and recruit students to work hourly to solve really specific accessibility gaps. Like I said, everything focuses on interdisciplinarity, so we often teach these classes with multiple instructors, one instructor from one of those different schools, um, or even we have some adjunct instructors who are community members with disabilities who are involved in teaching. We have students from diverse backgrounds in terms of their training um, participate in these classes, and we open up these classes both to graduate students and undergraduate students. So what do students actually do in these classes? They have deep interactions with community and museum staff. They identify and understand different existing challenges. They then try and address any of those challenges through building prototypes, and then finally evaluate those prototypes with a target population. So these classes are tremendously popular in these efforts with our students. And it's kind of, um, there's two things that really attract our students. One, students are really excited by real world problems. So it's usually pretty easy to get together an interesting group of excited students to talk about accessibility. And then they're really, really excited about anything that can impact their local community. So we have this kind of um, paired opportunity when we collaborate with local museums looking at accessibility. So I'm going to talk about three projects we've done in collaboration with Cooper Hewitt, the Tenement Museum, and then a new collaboration with Intrepid. So this was a project we did maybe two years ago in collaboration with Cooper Hewitt to explore different kinds of opportunities for them to improve the accessibility of their museum. So we had students, again, from these three different schools who are working together in this class. We had an equal number of seats reserved for students from each discipline. And then they worked on teams that were carefully balanced, so we had students from each discipline represented. Um, we taught this class um, on our main campus, but they had many, many field trips and opportunities to spend time at the site. So this is an example of a project that were pretty interdisciplinary. Cooper Hewitt said, hey, can you come in and different folks with new ideas come look at different opportunities. So there were four different projects that came out of this. One looking at mobility at the Cooper Hewitt, another one looking at augmented reality and verbal descriptions, one looking at indoor wayfinding, and one on website access. So to give you just a little bit of a sense of kind of how we evaluated these and how we took it into the real world, one, we had students um, who would shadow individuals who, from their target populations. Here's a photo of them shadowing a cane user going on a museum tour um, that was led by staff. And so by in the, being in this experience, the students got to see what were some of the obstacles, what were some of the challenges, what were some of the opportunities. The other example of things that we commonly do is we have evaluation sessions. So once students have prototypes, we then bring in members from the community or, and or museum staff to evaluate them. Here we have a photo of a screen reader user 
interacting with prototypes of more accessible websites. So a different project we did with Tenement was much more focused on what are the specific gaps that um, a cultural institution has in accessibility that maybe they don't have the resources or expertise to solve or they really want to engage with university to do. So this was an example. Um, they had a new exhibit um, that was called Under One Roof and they already had done a lot of work into accessibility where the space was um, wheelchair accessible. There was a lot of thought put into signage and seating, but they realized that there was more that they could do in terms of adding audio descriptions and captioning to their multimedia content. And so we worked with them to create a group of, I think, maybe 15 students who worked hourly to address those specific gaps. And then the students are actually evaluating them in an event that they have that's called Touch Tours, where they open up the museum exclusively to individuals who would like tactile interactions or benefit from captioning. And so they're doing, right now, they're still evaluating. So the final example that I wanted to talk about is a little bit more in depth. So this is something new that we did where we're collaborating with the Intrepid Museum. And there is a new uh, IMLS grant. So kind of really at the end here, of bigger end of collaboration, where we're starting to, we want to create a digital publication to summarize what can be done to help um, make interpretation of historical sites more accessible? And really thinking about many different diverse groups here. So we're currently in the phases of um, planning focus groups with both um, experts in accessibility, attendees of the museum, and staff to understand what are the current gaps. And then we'll have a class that then focuses on prototyping different kinds of solutions and thinking about that. All right, I think I've gone over my 10 minutes. So I want to thank you again to all of you for listening, our collaborators, funders, and I'm looking forward to participating in the discussion. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Jacob Kim, and I'm the webmaster at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Um, so I'm going to just briefly talk about some examples of uh, web access projects that we're working on at the Hirshhorn. And, um, First, um, I'd like to just begin by saying that as, the, uh, as a professional that works on the web and digital space, I think one of the very interesting things that um, we're trying to do at the Hirshhorn is using web technologies to kind of uh, enable new experiences in physical spaces and deliver new types of content. So some of the projects that we'll be talking about here um, kind of go into that space. Um, so the first, uh, to begin with, the Hirshhorn Eye. Um, how many of you guys have used the Hirshhorn Eye? Oh, great. So quite a number of you. So if you guys haven't used the Hirshhorn Eye, please come by the Hirshhorn after the <laughs> conference and try it out. So the Hirshhorn Eye is a museum guide. It's a web-based museum guide that allows uh, visitors to basically point their phones at artworks and get content back. Um, it uses image recognition technology to recognize artworks that we've activated in our space and deliver a specific type of content. At the Hirshhorn, that specific type of content is usually the artist talking about the artworks. So we have an opportunity as a contemporary art museum to kind of interview the artists that are still living and for them to give uh, insights and uh, stories about their process and their artworks to the visitors. Um, so when we started building this technology, um, we kind of started with kind of a baseline framework of, or based on a vision of wanting to enable our visitors to connect with our artworks in a very simple and um, easy to use kind of friendly way. Um, you know, we, d we looked at various different types of technology like location-based technology, NFC. Uh, ultimately, we kind of settled on creating something that allowed visitors to just point their phone at something and get the content back. So ultimately, what we decided uh, to you do was use uh, leverage image recognition technology. Um, so what does this have to do with um, accessibility? Um, one of the things that we're doing at, uh, with the Hirshhorn Eye is we're trying to um, kind of take what we've built and create a platform that allows other institutions and other museums to deliver, uh, to deliver their content in a, uh, using this technology uh, through uh, image recognition. Um, one of the exciting kind of uh, ways uh, that we've imagined um, kind of leveraging this, this technology is to provide um, different types of content 
uh, al al alternative types of content for visitors with disabilities. Um, so imagine a visitor um, coming uh, coming in with um, uh, with you know, a hearing disability. If they can point at an artwork or a visual artwork and then have the transcript kind of uh, live populated on our website, like wouldn't that be kind of an interesting way to deliver that type of content in any way? Um, so as mentioned, we're working right now with uh, various partners around the institution, kind of uh, taking this technology and creating a platform that will allow uh, different museums and different institutions to leverage image, image recognition technology through the web to create new experiences. Um, the second kind of project that I'd like to talk about is a project that we've been working closely with uh, Beth on and with uh, kind of